worship the Lord now through the reading and the studying and the preaching of his word. So please take your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 13. At Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. That's what we'll be studying this morning. A new chapter, a new narrative for us this morning as Barnabas and Saul set out on what we know as what we commonly call the first missionary journey. The title of this sermon is To the End of the Earth. And I trust that this phrase sounds familiar to you because it's taken from the first chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You know, we've seen the Holy Spirit fall on the day of Pentecost. We have seen in the book of Acts the gospel go to Jerusalem. We have seen the gospel go to all Judea and Samaria. And now in our text this morning, we are going to see the gospel go to the ends of the earth. Jesus' words are going to prove true in our text this morning. And yet, uh, this heart of God, of salvation reaching to the end of the earth, has been on his heart long before the earthly life of Christ. It has been long on his heart way before Acts chapter 1. Around 730 years earlier, speaking to Israel about their future restoration, uh, God says through the prophet Isaiah about the coming Messiah, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. You know, this is the heart of God. Though this text in Isaiah is speaking of a time still future from our perspective, in that text we see God's love not only for Israel, but for the nations as well. You know, not only for Israelites, but for a people gathered from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. And this heart of God that has been on his heart all throughout biblical history is the heart of God that we see in our text this morning. And it is this heart of God that we see that drives the mission of God for two Israelites, Barnabas and Saul, to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. I mean, how exciting is it that Barnabas and Saul are on this mission from God that is at the very heart that he has for both Israel and the nations? And that's what we're going to see in our text this morning. In fact, this is the main idea of our text. This is the outline for our text this morning. God's mission for Barnabas and Saul. God's mission for Barnabas and Saul. Called by God to the Jew first and also the Greek. God's mission for Barnabas and Saul, one, called by God, two, to the Jew first, and three, and also the Greek. And though in our text this morning, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, we're really only studying the beginning of Paul's travels, we are going to see this mission for Paul, Barnabas, and Saul, I should say, we're going to see it so clearly. And we're going to see it again and again and again as we study throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Before we study, before we jump into this text, I want to go to our Lord in prayer, and then we'll begin in verse 1. So, Lord, we're grateful. Grateful because you are so good to us. You're so gracious to us in so many ways, even now singing about this general revelation, even the ones who are Christ-less, who don't know the Lord, you even bless them. Lord, you are a good God. You are gracious. And, Lord, we see your goodness we see your graciousness in the word that you have given us. It is such a gift. It is such a joy to have your word. We know that we would be hopeless without it. And so, Lord, we're so grateful for not only that you've given us your word, but that we have the time this morning to assemble as the body of Christ, the church, and study it together. And I pray, Lord, that this wouldn't only be for knowledge. We, we want to grow in knowledge. We want to understand your word better. But Lord, it would be a shame if this did not reach our hearts. It would be a shame if this word did not then impact our lives, 
Lord, we know that all scripture is breathed out by you and it's profitable for teaching and reproof and correction, training and godliness and righteousness. We want the word to have that effect on us this morning. And so, Lord, we are grateful for this narrative recorded perfectly by Luke to us. And we know, Lord, that it's not just for our knowledge, but for our edification, for our growth in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that we'd look at the text like this that we would want to mature and grow. How can we apply this text to our lives? Father, this is our desire. We humble ourselves before you now, asking that you would show to us what you want us to see in this word. Make it clear for the people of God. Amen. Well, let's begin with the first point, called by God. Called by God in verses 1 through 3. If you remember last week, we were in the city of Caesarea Maritima. In Acts chapter 12, we studied the death of Herod last week, and this week we're back in a familiar city that we've studied before, uh, the city of Antioch. Look at verse 1. It says in verse 1, now, there, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And of course, we know a lot about Saul. We've seen this character before. We've heard a lot about Barnabas as well. But there's three leaders here in this list that are kind of sandwiched in between Barnabas and Saul. And what you need to know is that they are not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. And so what we know about these three figures is, well, exactly what it tells us here. Uh, It says that Simeon, he has a, a second name, Niger, which in Latin means black. So maybe he was from northern Africa or something like that. Uh, Lucius, the next name in the list, um, some people think that he is the gospel writer Luke, and that's because the names are are somewhat similar in Latin, but but outside of that, there's no really evidence for that being the case. Uh, Moving on in the list, most interestingly, interestingly, I think we see is Mannion. It says that Mannion is a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Now, what you need to know is we've been talking about the Herods, right, in the last couple weeks. This is not the Herod um, of Acts chapter 12. That was Herod Agrippa I. This Herod being spoken about here, Herod the Tetrarch, is another name for Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas. He ruled the land of Galilee during the life of Christ. This was the Herod of the Gospels. It was Herod the Tetrarch who Jesus called a fox, if you remember that passage in, in Luke chapter 13. It was Herod the Tetrarch who mocked Jesus the night before his arrest in that trial. It was this Herod that Manian was the lifelong friend of, the Roman leader of Galilee and enemy of Christ. The idea of lifelong friend here is really the idea of being reared together. Uh, I love this. In the words of one of my professors, he said that Manian and Herod were in diapers together. And what he's getting across by that is that they grew up together. They were reared together. That's the idea here of lifelong friend. In fact, what I think is so noticeable about this list, so obvious for us, is the great diversity that we see. We know that the gospel can officially be received by Gentiles as Gentiles. And the church in this diverse city of Antioch is bringing in Gentiles of all kinds and sorts, even those reared with pagan Roman enemies of Christ. And although not much is known about this list, right, that they're getting here in this text, what is known about them is that in verse 1, there are prophets and teachers. And again, we've seen prophets before in the book of Acts. If you remember Agabus from Acts chapter 11, these are prophets being used by God during this unique time in the church's life to communicate God's direct revelation to his church. And that's exactly what we see happening here with this new set of prophets. Uh, Look at verse 2. In the opening scene of this text, they're in Antioch. There's these five prophets and teachers. And verse 2 says, while they were worshiping the Lord, Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so it seems like they're in the middle of some public service, worshiping the Lord together, fasting together, and these prophets receive a revelation from God the Holy Spirit in the form of a clear command, set apart Barnabas and Saul. That is, mark them off, you know, set them aside, separate them 
from the rest for me, for a special work that I have sovereignly called them to, for a unique ministry that I have prepared for them to carry out. If you're thinking about what Barnabas and Saul were thinking, this was most likely a surprise to them, who, as we've seen, they've been here for a year, they've had such a fruitful ministry in the city of Antioch, and they probably thought it best to stay in the city for who knows how long. And yet, although this was a surprise to them, at least that's the impression that we get from the text, they had no previous idea that God would call them to this service. What we do know is that God knew. Uh, This was not a surprise to the all-knowing God. Our text makes clear, if you're looking at the text, that this is a work that he has called them to past tense. You know, our God who has made us a workmanship, preparing beforehand good works for us to walk in, like Ephesians 2 says, is here calling Barnabas and Saul to a work that he has called them to long ago. And though we see God's sovereignty in this call to this special work for Barnabas and Saul, I want you to notice the church's response. So look at verse 3, the church's response in verse 3. It says, Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them, and sent them off. You know, there's this this immediacy. There's this urgency that we see here in this text, a faithfulness, an obedience, a resolute response to God's command given to this church. After continuing to, to fast and pray some more, the text says they laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul, which is this act of commissioning or endorsing approving, identifying with this call and mission from God. And then the text says, they sent them off. This is such a faithful church that we see here in this text. And there are probably so many ways that we could imitate this church. But I really want to narrow down and focus on one way that our church can imitate this faithful church this morning. And that is, they are quick to obey the word of God even at great cost to themselves. They are quick to obey the word of God, even at great cost to themselves. And for them, they had God's word through these prophets and apostles in the first century. But for us, we have God's word through the completed scriptures at different mediums, yet both of us have clear commands from our Lord. After talking about the the eyewitness experience of the transfiguration, the apostle Peter, he writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you would do well to pay attention, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know, obedience to God's word in Scripture is nothing less than obedience to God Himself. If we disobey God's word, we are not disobeying a book. We're not disobeying ink and paper. We are disobeying the ultimate author of the book, which is our living God. And so we ought to obey the word of God quickly. That is, with a sense of urgency with a sense of readiness, but also like this faithful church in Antioch, we ought to obey the word of God even when it means great cost to ourselves. I mean, just think about how treasured, think about how loved Barnabas and Saul were in Antioch. We know they've been there for about a year teaching and building relationships. They were not prizing their own comfort. They were not prizing their own ease but faithfulness to God and obedience to his word. And so what's our price? Uh, How much are we willing to sacrifice to be faithful to God and his word? And this looks differently for, for each of us, whether it's a college student sacrificing approval from a campus culture that we know can be so wayward, or a businessman sacrificing profit because he knows that it was gained unjustly in a way that wouldn't honor the Lord, or a parent, uh, sacrificing career opportunities to be faithful in the home if the decision comes down to obedience to God and his word, even though there is great personal cost, what are we going to do? 
This is the question I think our church ought to consider as we see the example of this faithful church in Antioch. A called by God, verses 1 through 3. Called by God, verses 1 through 3. I want us to look next now at to the Jew first. Uh, to the Jew first in verses 4 and 5. You know, Barnabas and Saul understand that they have been called by God for this special service. And now we'll see in the book of Acts, their mission truly begins. And what we're going to see is that it is a mission to the Jew first. So look at verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John. And we've seen this John before. This is John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. He's the author of the Gospel of Mark. He's that son of Mary in Acts chapter 12 that we just saw. They had this John Mark to assist them. Uh, Though in verse 3, the text makes very clear that it was the leaders of the church in Antioch that sent out Barnabas and Saul. What's interesting in verse 4 is that the text tells us that the real agent was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who called for Barnabas and Saul to be set apart in verses 1 through 3. It was the Holy Spirit who sent them out on this mission of special service to him. And we understand that it was the Holy Spirit who guided them on where to go. How did they know to go where they went? How did they know to go to the island of Cyprus? We trust that the Holy Spirit is guiding them, and where the Holy Spirit guides and directs these two traveling prophets, the text says, is down from Antioch to the city of Seleucia. And I don't know how much you know about the city of Seleucia, but what you need to know is that Antioch is an inland city, that it's not on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, it's landlocked. And the reason they're traveling to Seleucia, which is 16 miles west of Antioch is to get to a port city on the Mediterranean Sea. And then what we'll see is that they'll sail 60 miles off the mainland of Israel to the island of Cyprus. And this island, the island of Cyprus, it's an island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. This is where Barnabas and Saul are going to stay for the rest of our time this morning, on this island of Cyprus. You know, Cyprus was an island that was always settled Uh, If we read the Old Testament, you know that there was this series of empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and whenever those empires conquered the whole world, they also conquered Cyprus. And in 22 BC, Rome takes over. We know that Rome is the empire in power during the life of Christ, during the apostles. So Rome in 22 BC, so about 22 years before the life of Christ, they take over Cyprus and they make it a province, which is a, you know, some sort of sub-government, like a state. Uh, And they rule it by a proconsul, which is basically a fancy term for a governor. And that's going to be important, of course, as we keep reading. It is this governor that rules from the capital city of Paphos. That's the city in our text, uh, the the city of Paphos. Now, that's on the west side of the island. This is really important background information. It'll make sense soon. That is on the west side of the island. And before they go to Paphos, they land in Salamis. That's the former capital. So they land on the island of of Cyprus, they first stop in Salamis, which is the former capital, and later they'll make their way to Paphos. Look back at verse 5. It says that in Salamis, this is where they land on the island of Cyprus, Barnabas and Saul, it says, proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. You know, just as we understand that it's the Holy Spirit guiding them on where they are to go, we can equally understand that it is the Holy Spirit that is guiding them to the synagogues of the Jews. And Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians, 586 BC. And after that happened, after the temple, that central place of worship was destroyed, the Jews in exile started gathering in local synagogues. They were, they were local, a synagogue in every city. They would gather in each and every city in a place called a synagogue, which is a house of assembly. That's what the word means, house of assembly. And every city, it seems, had a synagogue. This is where the Jews would come together and worship Yahweh, worship their God. And so the strategy here of Barnabas and Saul on this island is to go from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue. And in fact, this is not only relevant for our text, This is relevant for all of the travels of Paul 
And every city he goes to, whether it's on the island, whether it's next week when we're on the mainland in Perga and Asia Minor, he will go first to the synagogues of the Jews and preach the gospel to the Jew first. You might think, you know, this is so interesting. What an interesting trend that we see in Paul's ministry. He's going first to the Jews. And I want to make clear that this is not a vain philosophy. You know, this isn't pointless. Paul isn't doing this for, for no reason. Rather, he holds a deep conviction about this being a central part of his mission. Uh, though we know him as the apostle to the Gentiles, he knows that he first has to go to the Jews. He describes this heart for his own nation Israel in the, in the book of Romans, chapters 9 through 11. In Romans chapter 9, he lays out his earnest affection for his own kinsmen according to the flesh. He lays out his affection for Israel, saying that he himself would rather be accursed, separated from Christ, in order that they may be saved. What a love. In chapter 10, he moves on and talks with this, this personal grief. You can almost just sense it in him as he's going through this in chapter 10. He, he talks about the nature of their rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. But then in chapter 11, he says that God has not rejected his people, Israel. And though there is this partial hardening on Israel today, on a future day when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, all Israel will be saved. Because they are beloved for the sake of God's covenant with their ancestors, and because God's election of Israel, the text says, is irrevocable. You know, and as we're looking at how to apply this, we, we, we are not in this ethnic nation. But even though we're not in this ethnic nation, I think it would be right of us to long for what Paul longs for. It would be right of us to put our hope in what Paul is expectantly hoping for and what God is ultimately longing for, what God is ultimately hoping for through the writings of Paul. We looked at verses 1 and 3, and we not only want to obey Scripture's commands, but we want to believe Scripture's truth. We not only want to obey Scripture's commands, we also want to believe Scripture's truth. And the Scriptures are very clear on what God has in store for this nation, Israel. And Saul, Paul, knows this. He writes his manifesto about this in Romans 9 through 11. But even though we're not in that text this morning, you can see his heart, his love for his own nation, and the future that God has for them. You can see that as he practically goes from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue. Uh, to the Jew first, verses 4 and 5. And I want to look lastly now at, and also the Greek. This is going to be about half our text, verses 6 through 12, and also the Greek. We've already heard in our scripture reading this morning, morning in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul writes, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also the Greek. You know, Barnabas and Saul are certainly not ashamed of the gospel. And they have been called by God, verses 1 through 3, uh, to this mission of preaching the gospel to the Jew first, verses 4 and 5, but also the Greek, that is, any Gentile, any non-Jew, verses 6 through 12. So look at verse 7. I'm sorry, look at verse 6, and we're going to read now verses 6 through 12. Verse 6 begins, and it says, When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamis, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, 
And when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. You know, verse 6 tells us that Barnabas and Saul had gone through the entire island of Cyprus from Salavis, where they first landed on the very east of the island. They travel west preaching the gospel as they go. You know, we'd assume that they would continue this pattern of going from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue all the way to the very west side of the island, as far as the capital city of the entire island, the city of Paphos. They had traveled 90 miles preaching the gospel from where they first landed. And we know Luke is the author of Acts. He's recording this for us. I, I wish I knew, you know, what happened along the way. You know, Luke doesn't tell us any of that. 90 miles of, of preaching the gospel, and Luke doesn't record any of that. He, he takes the liberty to, to summarize and just say, well, they, they traveled across the island, but he puts great emphasis on what happens next in the city of Paphos. And rightly so. If you've read this narrative before, it's, it's exciting. And Luke records this for us. Before they arrive, and I'm sorry, when they arrive in Paphos, the text says they come upon a Jewish magician and false prophet named Bar Jesus. Another name for him is Elamis or Elamis. In fact, the, verse 7 gives us more information. It, it wasn't that the initial contact was with this false prophet first, but verse 7 says that Barnabas and Saul were met by those who had been summoned by the proconsul, the very governor of the entire island of Cyprus, an intelligent man, the text says, Sergius Paulus, who was a Gentile of all Gentiles. He was a Greek-educated Roman government official. And so first, Sergius Paulus must have heard of Barnabas and Saul and that they were coming to his city. Uh, second, this prominent governor summoned men to then fetch Barnabas and Saul so that he himself could hear the word of God. And then third, Barnabas and Saul are brought to him, brought to Sergius Paulus in the city of Paphos. And what they find out is that they see that a Jewish magician and false prophet is with him, bar Jesus. You know, a Jewish magician and false prophet. This is such a rare combination of traits that we see in this man. And to start off, he's Jewish, so his heritage is that of God's set-apart nation in the Old Testament. And even though he's a Jew, uh, we see that he is a pagan sorcerer, which is often tied with demonic activity. And he's a false prophet, you know, uttering words from God that God never spoke. That both of these are so greatly condemned in the Old Testament for the nation of Israel. I mean, if there was one sin, if there was one lesson that the destruction of Jerusalem, that the whole 70 years in exile, if there was one lesson that God taught Israel in that time and a lesson that they learned, it was to forsake these pagan practices, to forsake false prophecies. And ironically, this man named Bar-Jesus, his name means son of the Savior, Bar-Jesus, Bar-Yeshua, son of the Savior, this man embodies the very sins that God especially hated in Israel in the Old Testament. And so there is this intelligent man who desires to hear the word of God. He's calling Barnabas and Saul to him. And though that's the case, there is this Jewish magician and false prophet there to oppose them, there to oppose Barnabas and Saul. The text says, but Elamus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, Oppose them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. There is such a great drama in this text, at this point especially, uh, because this is nothing less than a standoff between God and Satan, and the stakes and the consequences could not be higher. Here you have two men of the one true and living God, two true servants and prophets of God, Barnabas and Saul, fighting for the conversion of this prominent government official, the, government of the, the governor of the entire island of Cyprus, against this demonic magician and satanically empowered false prophet Bar-Jesus, which or is also called Elemis, which is the transliteration of the Arabic word for magician, the same person. God's men versus Satan's man, vying for the eternal destiny of the soul of this proconsul, Sergius Paulus. And so as there's this, this standoff here in the text, God versus Satan, and yet we know we do not have to worry. 
Because our God is the true God, he is the living God, he is the sovereign God, and though we see a standoff in this text, there is not a battle. There is a standoff, but it really doesn't last long. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says, But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord will be upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. You know, in the intensity of this standoff vying for the conversion of the governor of Cyprus, Saul, who it says here, his Roman name is Paul, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, which is used by Luke to speak of this special equipping for a certain task. And filled with the Holy Spirit, he confronts Elamis. He confronts Bar-Jesus, this false magician. Ironically, though, his name, like we looked at, means son of the Savior. Saul makes clear that he is nothing more than a son of the devil. Uh, he is the enemy of all that is right and good. And as a magician, he is full of deceit and trickery, and thus he is really the epitome of a villain to God. And the plain evidence of all these claims that Paul is making is that he is making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. You know, here is Sergius Paulus, primed for conversion. You know, he has the opportunity to hear the gospel of salvation in Christ directly from the apostle Saul, directly from the servant Barnabas. I mean, how could the path of salvation, the way to the Lord Jesus, be any straighter, be any clearer than for this governor of Cyprus? And yet here is Bar-Jesus, hindering the word of God, being an obstacle, being a stumbling block, making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. And this is not just Saul speaking here. This is God speaking through Saul. And this is confirmed by what happens next in our text. Uh, Saul says, and now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. Uh, that is to say that God is about to act upon you as the hand of God in Scripture always indicates the action of God. And then he says, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. You know, the prophecy by Paul of a graciously temporary judgment of blindness as a consequence for this wicked man's actions. And then after Paul speaks, God acts. It's, the text says, immediately, immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. You know, God could have vindicated Paul's words the next day. He could have vindicated Paul's words a month or now or a year from now. But what we see in the text is that God vindicates Paul as a true prophet immediately. And we think, why does he do this? Why does he do it immediately? And we don't always know the reasons or why God acts the way he does or what he does and when he does it. But I think there's a pretty good guess in this text. We know God doesn't work these miracles for selfish reasons or reasons of personal vindication. I think there's a great reason we see that it happens immediately because someone witnesses this obviously divine event. Look at verse 12. It says, then the proconsul, that governor, Sergius Paulus, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred. For he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. You know, the proconsul was converted. This is the day of that proconsul's salvation. And could you just imagine the story that he has now to tell? You know, when was he converted? The text says, when he saw what had occurred, it was that moment in time that he believed and that he was saved. When he saw Saul's prophecy fulfilled, when he saw this divine blindness fall upon this false magician, this false prophet, this, this wicked man. And so that's the moment in time that he believed, but why did he believe? Why does the text say that he was converted at that moment in time? Verse 12 says, for or because he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I just don't expect that word teaching to be there. 
I could imagine if it said he was astonished at what he had seen. He was astonished at this observable miracle, but that is not what the text says. It says he believed the reason why he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. In the parable of Lazarus and the rich man that Jesus gives during his earthly life, in this parable, after the rich man in hell realizes that he can't escape the fires that he's in, he calls out in this parable to Father Abraham. And he says this. He says, then I beg you, Father, to send him, and he's talking about Lazarus, to send Lazarus to my father's house back on earth. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, and that's the Old Testament, Moses, the law, the prophets, the prophets, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, the scriptures that they already have, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. You know, at specific times in biblical history, there were observable miracles to authenticate the word of God. However, even in those times, observable miracles were never, are never, and will never be the cause of salvation, including both yours and mine. A salvation is grounded only in the word of God, because we know that faith comes through hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. And that means that all you need to know about salvation in Christ is all that you have in front of you right now. All the information you need to know in order to how to be saved from the penalty of your sins is what you have right in front of you. With the word of God in your laps this morning, this word that we are studying, you have a straight path to the Lord Jesus. God offers to all of us the gospel of salvation made possible by the all-sufficient death of Christ that paid for our every sin, past, present, and future, washed away forever. If we would only bow the knee and come to him in repentant faith. Then the proconsul believed, verse 12, when he saw what had occurred. Why? Because he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the heart of God on display. The heart of God that drives the mission of God for Barnabas and Saul. A heart that not only desires for Israelites to be saved, but also desires, and we hear this language, to gather a people from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation to himself through the teaching, through the proclamation of the word of God. Saul has officially now with Barnabas set off on what we commonly know as the first missionary journey. Uh, First, we see that he was faithfully and obediently sent by this church in Antioch, even at a great sacrifice to his life and to the life of the church, uh, which is a challenging reminder for us to obey the word of God quickly, even when it means great sacrifice, great cost for our church. Second, we saw they're then on their mission and they travel to the island of Cyprus, preaching the gospel we see to the Jew first by moving from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue, in which we are challenged to long for what God longs for, hope for what the scriptures hope for, and put our trust in what God is ultimately looking forward to, a mission to and future for the nation of Israel. And after they preach the gospel to the Jew first, they come upon this Uh, Gentile, this Greek. We see that God's mission third is also to the Greek, that is the Gentile. We see the preaching of the gospel to Sergius Paulus. He is a, a Gentile of all Gentiles, like we said, but now he is a Christian governor of the island of Cyprus. Converted because he was astonished at not the miracle, but the teaching of the Lord from Barnabas and Saul, which is a call for us to hold fast to the unchanging word of God as all we need to know about how to come to faith in Christ and have the penalty of our sins removed. And to receive this forgiveness of our sins, just like Sergius Paulus did nearly 2,000 years ago. Separated by so much time, 
it is the same means of salvation. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And for the Apostle Saul, Apostle Paul, his Roman name being Paul, this is really just the beginning of his travels. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12 is just the beginning of so much he has ahead of him. Uh, Week after week, we're going to continue studying these journeys, seeing God's calling for him to the Jew first and also the Greek to the ends of the earth. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we are so thankful that you have raised up servants all throughout history. Servants who are used by you in such special ways, and we see this happening with with Barnabas and Saul. We're so grateful for them, Father. I speak on behalf of everyone here, most likely that we are so grateful for all of Paul's writings, for Paul's ministry, how they speak to our hearts, how they speak to our souls, how we're so fed by them. And Lord, this is the beginning of Paul's travels. And this is the beginning of really Paul's ministry to the ends of the earth. And it's such a delight for us, Father, to read about it this morning. We're so thankful again that you have preserved your word for us to read. And Father, we pray that you give us the wisdom. We pray that you give us the courage uh, to apply this text to our life so many applications, such faithful examples that we see in this church at Antioch, such a faithful example we see in Barnabas and Saul as they travel. Father, help us to apply this word. Help it to speak to our hearts. Help it to change our lives. And Lord, we trust that you'll do this as we humble ourselves before you. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would have his full effect in our hearts and minds as we continue to meditate on this word. And Father, a a wonderful way that we're going to be meditating on this word is through our first week of small groups today. Lord, a new ministry for us. It's an exciting thing to jump into, but we pray, Father, that this would be a tool in our church where we could excel in love, excel in bearing fruit, excel in growing in knowledge, bearing one another's burdens. Lord, we need your mind to do this. We need your strength. And so we pray, Father, that you'd supply to us all we need so that we can represent you that we can be like you to the rest of our small group, caring for them, working together with them, growing in knowledge together. Lord, we want to be Christ-like, and we pray that you'd help us do this, and we pray that small groups would be a medium for that to occur. Lord, we look to you. You're the audience of this church. We want to worship you. We want to glorify you, and this is all for you, Lord. Amen.